And the reason why that is, is because mitochondria are, are vital. I can tell everyone in this room your mitochondria is working, otherwise you wouldn't be here. Because it's responsible for generating 80% of the cellular fuel at a molecular level. In fact, we're now moving into a new phase where there's um, beginning to recognize that there are mitochondrial diseases. And many atypical diseases that we see now are going to end up being mitochondrial diseases. Um, estimates go as high as, um, in incredibly high, that as many as one out of every five people may have a mitochondrial disorder. And that's because mitochondria, they code for actually 37 genes. Now, 13 of those genes, they're important because they make sure, or let's see, 20, it's hard to do math when you're in front of a group. But anyway, um, there's 13 genes there that are very important for energy production. They work in concert with signals that are sent down from the nucleus. Um, and the other genes just simply make sure that these get made. So I think what I'm trying to say here, that maybe I should have said at the beginning, is that just simply looking at the population genetics and making a judgment as to what it means um, to a group of people from 2,600 years ago is very precarious because this just isn't simply a genetic marker. Um, it's vital for energy metabolism. So this is just um, a gee whiz figure, and you're not supposed to be able to figure it out because it's supposed to overwhelm you. Um, with, with, with all of the metabolic pathways, that's actually driven by mitochondrial DNA. So actually we found that, that when a cell develops pathology, for example, on um, cancer develops, in some cases, it shows up early in the mitochondrial DNA in the form of alterations in this simple genetic, genetic alphabet. So now the claims are, are made against Y chromosome and mitochondrial DNA. So let's first of all take a look at, at the Y chromosome. So these have unique patterns of an inheritance, and that is that they, they stay steady through, through a line. In fact, um, it's not surprising that some Jewish groups have a specific Y chromosome marker at a high frequency of about 50%. If you read the heavy, heavy um, paternal lineages, for example, in Chronicles, or if you've seen the home teachers, and where they put that tape in, and they go on Jehoshaphat, Jehosu, and whoever, that's literally true. Um, long histories of, of paternal um, chromosomes, and those can actually get fixed, but what happens is that dad has to have a son. Son has to have another son, it has to be passed on. Now if this dad here um, had a daughter, he doesn't pass on his paternal Y chromosome. That doesn't mean that he doesn't have a brother out here that doesn't pass it on. But this comes into a very um, important point called coalescence, where over time, most of these genetic signals um, can and do disappear. It's been proven now from a statistical viewpoint. So we also have um, mitochondrial DNA, which we, um, we get from our, from our moms. So actually, in, in mitochondrial DNA, um, there is, in the same paternal or Y chromosome, there's a maternal name written in these four simple letters, the G, the A, the T, and the C. And this occurs in, um, in a subset of the entire genome. So where the maternal name is written is usually, is usually very small. We call that um, the hypervariable region. And same game. So if mom has daughters, then this is passed on. If mom had a son right here, this isn't passed on. So I want you to keep this in mind because this is very important when you start to talk about really small groups like Lehi's family and you consider the eight years that they were in the wilderness. Statistically, you start to get problems with the frequencies that have been um, suggested. So how did, these, um, how did these look? How do we actually read these? Um, it's actually quite, quite dull. So this is, and I just said that this was exciting, didn't I? So each one of these lines actually represents, you could say, a maternal name. This is actually sequencing data, what we call. And you can see there's the G's, the A's, the T's, and the C's. 
And then down here, the software, and I should say that without the advent of computers, this would be impossible. And now um, many large companies like IBM are trying to get interested into these types of biosciences because there's so much information that needs to be decoded. And because of the coming revolution in healthcare, um, they see these as, as tremendous um, revenue generators. So one thing I, I forgot to mention, um, sort of the blue sky of all this, is that in not too distant future, you'll go into, the f into your physician and you'll swipe a card. And it'll say, okay, well, Scott Gordon back there, he doesn't respond very well to ibuprofen because he has this particular gene, but we know aspirin works for him. Um, ampicillin may not work for you, but we'll give you tetracycline. So all these things will become a very highly practiced um, type of, of science, and things will be treated long before they show up clinically because they'll be anticipated at the DNA level. So all this information is, is inter interestingly, once again, written, written in this code. But for our purposes here, so what happens if you look at this little dot right here, the software gives us this, um, this heads up and says, well, there's somebody here that doesn't match. So if you run up all these T's, we see, aha, there's a C right here. So this person actually has a different name simply because this differs by one letter of the genetic alphabet. And the same here. So you can imagine the problem with trying to handle all of this data when you're looking at populations of people that have billions of um, pieces of information. But what's important, I think, here is that, um, is that most of the lineages can actually be the same. And most of them probably swamp this particular individual here. And this is a sampling of a large population of people from um, Thunder Bay, Ontario, Canada. And this um, information, this maternal information, and also the Y chromosome, has been used to come up with various ideas. And this is really quite ingenious and, and very exciting. Is that there's been multiple migrations um, out of Africa. You probably all heard of the seven daughters of Eve, and you can send in your DNA, and they'll tell you which Eve you came from, and Adam, and, and all that type of thing, which are interesting commercial ideas. But so from this, um, and the caveat is, these are, once again, modern populations. So we can see that um, Native Americans really, scientists aren't very inventive, because they have four maternal names, A, B, C, D, and X. That's not very exciting, is it? But um, it looks like, really, from areas here in Siberia, that many of the modern-day signatures actually well, actually, but they, they do match um, these people coming out of Siberia. And to a lesser extent, there are some haplotypes in Asia that match as, as well. But it, it's these major four, and I think that's, um, that's, here's where the claims come, that, well, sheesh, Native Americans have these haplotypes, and uh, where are the ancient Near Eastern haplotypes when we look at modern DNA? Um, but another important thing to notice is that there are different distributions of these haplotypes. And that's another thing that comes into play.